2 Corinthians chapter 12. Alicia says, my color is red. I wore this shirt. Come up here. It, it's hard for me to fix it because I have to. Yeah. There you go. Appreciate your help. You're the new cameraman, Al. You're the guy. Huh? There you go. Oh, did you break it? Nope. Just cracked it. <laughs> You're the cameraman. She's the director. Second Corinthians 12. Turn your Bible there. Verse 7. Um, thank you, I appreciate that. There's, there's a few things that really trip my trigger. And um, when it gets tripped, then I'm, I, I've got a mean guy in me and I don't like him. But there's a couple things that set it off. And uh, one of them is the cross. You don't cross the cross, amen? You don't. You don't, uh, you don't slight the cross. You don't diminish the cross of Christ. And the cross is really what, uh, what Paul is getting at here when he's talking about thorns in the flesh. Because Christ bore our curse. Thorns represent a curse, and Christ bore that to the cross. And his point that he's making here is that he's not strong. Not in, not in certain ways. He's not strong. And even where he was strong, God weakened him by this thorn in the flesh. And so twice now that we have um, extended love and grace to the people of Kenya by feeding them, there's a reason why I don't go on Facebook very much. And I would post... The last two times we did this, I would post the, the joy of it and the pictures of it. And uh, I've had not just negative comments, not, not real biblical negative comments like this is not right according to Scripture, blah, blah, blah. It's just childish stuff, hateful stuff. And one lady I recognized instantly as a, as a witch. And I'm not just calling her a name. Because she, she posted in the comments that I was feeding people who have lack thinking. That, and it's their fault and I, and I guess I shouldn't have fed them because their whole thinking process is they think poverty. And I know part of where she got that because Kenneth Copeland made a, uh, did a TV show here a while back where he's talking to one of his rich buddies about how it's everybody else's fault that they're poor. Because they don't have the prosperity thinking like he does. And he says, I'll give you an example. Uh, our, our, our poverty thinking is, if our toaster breaks, we try to fix it. Instead, he said, that's poverty thinking. Well, that's what got my grandparents through the Depression. Okay? Is that you didn't, and that's what got their marriage to 50, 60 years was if something's broke, you don't throw it away. It fixed it. And so that he's got his rich buddy, one of, one of them other televangelists that are rich off of everybody else, off of poor people's backs, that is telling everybody if, if you know, if your car's got 100,000, if your car's got 50,000 miles on it, 
get rid of it and go buy a new one. And if the toaster don't work, it's got a button off of it, throw it away and go buy a new one. If you don't have the money, that's prosperity thinking. And when you think that way, money just cut, you, just, you just draw money to you. And that's witchcraft. I mean, in its simplistic form, it is nothing but pure witchcraft. And I called this lady out on it. I called her a witch publicly, and then I went privately and called her a witch. I didn't wait around to see what her was. You don't, listen, Elijah didn't wait around for Jezebel. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, but that just, it really gets me to start blaming people for how they are, and it's their fault. And what I said was, you go over there, and you try to sow seed in their sand, because I've been over there, and all they got is sand. Sand and acacia trees, that's it. And there's one river that runs through there where you might be able to grow something next to the banks of it. Other than that, it's hot and it's a desert. And, and I just kind of went off on it. But Paul teaches in this lesson that it is not... It, the, there's a saying that says, God helps those who help themselves. Read that to me in the scriptures. Read that one to me. Show it to me. Now, I'm all about the book of Proverbs and how it says, you know, go to, the, go to the ant, thou sluggard. I get that. Okay? But there was a picture that was sent me uh, from, the, from the food program Friday. It's one, it's, I got about five or six pictures from it. There's a video I haven't seen yet. Michael was telling me about it this morning. But one particular picture... I, the, it shows the crowd of people, and they were all sitting there very politely because they, they came to hear, my new, my new name is Muzungu Ekeyokan, which means the white watchman. <laughs> okay. I want a I cape and a little mask and the white <laughs> But anyway, um, but there was a man sitting in that crowd. And I just looked at him, and I just started bawling, because here's a man that came to feed his family, because he's of a family age. And, um, boy, that really broke me down. So, it's always going to be, when you do good, there's always going to be somebody. And you know what? I, I have to remind myself that I don't mind people like that because you need them. You need them. You need them to tell you that you're not as good as you think you are. And there always has to be a thorn in every good thing that you do. That's, that's that lesson here. Paul was the greatest evangelist, the greatest church planner, the greatest missionary, the greatest preacher, the great preacher, greatest theologian, greatest Christian in the world. But he didn't see himself as that way. And neither should we. So anyway, uh, pray for the witches out there who need to get their eyes in the scriptures and then they would, they would unlearn some of that witchcraft nonsense that you, you are prosperous only if you think prosperity. That's called, the, there's an there's a actual witchcraft teaching called the law of attraction. And it says if you say and think negative things, then negative things come to you. If you say and think positive things, then when... And I'll get off on something else, too, in a minute. This idea of karma, don't you ever let that come out of your mouth. Because let me tell you what karma is about. Karma is all about, it's that doctrine in India is the reason why they leave people who are poor in India. They don't do anything for them because the doctrine of karma says they had it coming. Meanwhile, the rich people in India... They deserve to be rich because they lived a better past life and karma is rewarding them. So don't give me this nonsense about karma. Okay? I'm sick of that stuff. Oh, you watch your Karma's going to get you. Uh-uh. Grace got me. Because if I got what I had coming, I would be down in the, in the gutter with the poor people getting what I deserve. But I have not gotten what I've deserved. I've gotten grace. That's what this is about. So, 
2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. He says who it is, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. There's a clue right there as to what this is, even though Paul is not necessarily saying exactly what his thorn is. But he says he besought the Lord thrice. Why thrice? Why didn't he say a bunch of times? Why didn't he say more than twice? But he said that it might depart from me, and he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Underline that passage in your Bible. Memorize that and repeat that to yourself about five or six times a day. When you think that your day is going real bad, just remember grace really is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You'll not hear that preached in any of the charismatic witchcraft churches they do not glo- it is it is a sin in their eyes to glory in infirmities it is a sin in their eyes they learned this from Finnis Dake Finnis Dake said you are praising and worshiping Satan if you allow sickness into your body and he died of what was the Parkinson's disease does that died of Parkinson's I'm dying of memory loss But anyway, he died of Parkinson's disease, and it takes years to kill you. And for years, he then became his own lie, a testimony to his own lie. Because he he could not, with his faith, get rid of the disease that was slowly killing his brain and his body and his central nervous system. He could not do it. So, glory in your infirmities. Don't glory in your strengths. Glory in your infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Your life should be about nothing but giving God the praise and the glory, not giving yourself the glory and not receiving the praise and glory from people. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, go to Genesis 3, and let's, let's get into the meaning of what Paul was referring to when he was talking about his thorn. Genesis chapter 3, actually, uh, the proto-gospel, what, they call the, what theologians call the proto-gospel is in Genesis 3.15. So I'll read that uh, as it pertains to our service this morning. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee, he's talking to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between, and ladies, isn't there a little warfare going on between women and snakes? Right? Who is it in the house that kills the snakes? The man. Who is it that hates the snakes the woman (laughs) but i guess i would throw myself in on that too i hate snakes i hate them huh i scream like a little girl i do i was i was squirrel hunting with my dad and i jumped up in a tree because i walked up on a snake and dad looked down he said ah it's just a little black snake i don't care what color he is it's a snake. I do not like them. I do not like them. Caleb come in all bright-eyed one day, and he was known for fish stories. You know what I'm talking about? Okay? The fish is this big, really. And he said, Dad, there's a snake out there that is, he said, it's this big around. And I'm going, oh, good grief. And I'm going to call him on it. So I walk out there. And moving away and slithering underground, I saw this much of this big around, and I went. And by the time I went to get you, the thing was gone, and I'm going, now nobody's going to believe either one of us. I saw it. Ugh. Do what? Yeah. A snake, a snake. But anyway, 
When, I, my point is women hate snakes, okay? So God, and God put it in there. And we're the church, we're a woman, we hate snakes, amen? So between, the, between thy seed and her seed, now look at that, look at your Bible. The seed of the woman, her DNA, her offspring, and the serpent's seed. And you chase that through the Bible, son of Belial, child of Belial, daughter of Belial, children of Belial, ye child of the devil, uh, ye generation of vipers, Jesus said. So I believe it's real. But he said, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so we look at that and we see a clear prophecy of Christ who comes to bruise the head of the serpent. And of course, the serpent bruised his heel when he was on the cross. And so in verse 17, unto Adam, we know what the woman's curse is. Uh, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and that's true. And then verse 17, and, that, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Watch this now. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And I want to stop right here, and I want you to ask the question, what are we doing in world agriculture or American agriculture to stop this curse? Okay, we're not praying is what we're not doing. What we're doing is you have the big companies. Monsanto, which had been bought out by who, Bear? Bear, I think Bear bought out Monsanto. But anyway, you have these big seed companies. You have these big poison companies that are coming up with ways of destroying any kind of weed, any kind of uh, thorn or thistle. Uh, or, or tares or anything like that, Darnell that grows up in the field, they're trying to custom design all these different poisons, so we're spraying these poisons on there. Does that have an effect? They tell us no, I'm not so sure about that. But then, now we're getting into the genetic manipulation age. Let's fight it on a genetic level. Let's design, let's rewrite the DNA of corn, Soybeans, rice, wheat, barley, you know, oats, you name it. Let's rewrite the DNA of all these things so that they are pestilence resistant. So that, so that any kind of varmint or critter or pestilence or any kind of bug does not recognize this as rice. Well, if they don't recognize it as rice, how is our body going to recognize it? So, so they're redesigning things, and, and what we're doing is we're going to end up tipping the balance of nature. And I think if you look at the book of Revelation and see the things that are coming to this earth, and you read Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, there's, there's curses that God is going to send forth to this world that have everything to do with pestilences and different uh, biohazards and sicknesses and things like that. I think man's going to create that. Okay? I think we're in the business of it. But man is right now trying to, in his own ways, design or write his way out of the curse that God cursed the ground with. Every farmer knows certain things you have to do every year, and you have to do it all year long, just to keep the corn growing at its peak, so we can get the most yield out of it, so we can get the most money out of it, uh, so we can bypass the curse that God placed on the ground. And part of that curse is that we're going to die. And so man is coming up with ways now of writing DNA and writing his way out of that curse, bypassing the cross. The cure for death is the cross. The cure for death is Jesus and his substitutionary atonement. But man now is trying to come up with his own way of bypassing thorns and thistles in the ground and bypassing the curse of death by rewriting his genetics or by altering his life so that we merge with the technology of this world so that we no longer have to fear dying. 
And what we're trying to do is man is trying to get out of surrendering to Jesus Christ. So, but that's the thorn. Verse 18, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So God said, yes, you'll eat of the field, but you're going to have to sow it first. And I mean, what farmer doesn't have to sow corn every year, soybeans every year, rice, wheat, barley, all of those. What farmer doesn't have to do that? Because those things don't grow well naturally. It has to be done. Whereas thistles, darnel, poison darnel, thorns, all of those things, they just grow. Na Nobody has to sow those. They grow naturally. Weeds grew up naturally, okay? All of those terrible things, just, they just happen naturally. But it takes effort. All that Adam had in the garden was freely given to him. God said that. God said, of all the fruit of the trees of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. Adam did not have to labor for that which sustained him. But because of sin, because of that curse, all of us must labor to eat. Amen? All of us. Even in, I mean, I know what it's like to sweat. Even in standing here, I know what it's like to sweat. And we all must labor to eat. But anyway, the idea of thorns was, it was part of the curse of sin. So thorns and Thistles, thistles are related to thorns. They're pretty much, they're prickly, terrible things that no one likes. You don't put thorns and thistles on your plate. No one decorates their plate with thistles. Okay? Uh, we used to run through the woods all the time, run through fields and get cockle burrs attached to our breeches leg and our socks and our, our uh, shoelaces and sometimes matted in our hair depending on what we were doing. But those things are just, they're natural breeders. They just take over everything. I talk about the flower garden that I have. And uh, if I miss a week in dealing with that flower garden, those, whatever, whatever thorns or thistles that is that grows up in there, I'm sick of them. And I've pulled a million of them out. If I've pulled one of them out and I'm going, where do they keep coming from? When am I going to be done pulling thistles out of this flower bed? I don't think I'm ever going to be done. I think they're going to come back every year. I don't know how the seed gets there, but it's there. So that's what it represents. It, represent, it is the curse and part of our sin. Part of the things that we do. Notice this Genesis 3. Sin comes in three forms. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Paul Ask God three times to remove that. Okay? And I'm going to lay a case out for you that there are things that you did when you were lost. There are things that God took away from you when you got saved, naturally. There are things that God will not take away from you, even though you're saved. Even though He says, I don't want you to do these things. God has it in his power to take it away. You have asked God to take it away. But has God taken it away? The answer is no. So I'm going to lay out a case for it. Number one, this is where we find it. We find it in Genesis chapter 3, as a result of our sin. Number two, turn to Numbers chapter 33. I just think the number matches. Numbers 33. This is what God said. Good morning, come on in, make yourself at home. Numbers chapter 33, God is going to tell them something about going into the land. Let's pick it up in um, verse 51, and we'll work our way down to 55. Verse 51 in Numbers 33, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures, destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places. 
Verse 53, And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. God gave them the land, and there were inhabitants there already, and God was going to get rid of them. And God plainly said to Israel, I'm not letting you in this land because you're the best of all people in the world. He said, but I'm driving out the inhabitants of Canaan. I, I gave that land to Abraham your father. I swore it unto him. And these inhabitants that are in that land, they are wicked. They are vile. We know that the land was full of giants. We know that. We know that the inhabitants were evil people. They had evil practices. They followed evil gods. They worshiped devils. And God said, I'm going to dispossess them. And I'm going to put you, you're going to get to live in their house. You're going to get to live in their city, their walled cities. You're going to get to take over whatever furniture they got. You get to keep it. God said, I'm going to let you have it all, but I want you to drive every single one of them out. So verse 54, you shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. And that's what they did. And to the more you shall give the inherit the more inheritance and to the fewer you shall give the less inheritance for every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth, according to the tribes of your fathers, ye shall inherit. Verse 55, here it is, underline this. But if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes. You've had one of those, haven't you? A little splinter in your eye. Pricks in your eyes, thorns in your sides. And shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Now God said, run them all out. Get rid of them. Because he said, if you don't. See, there's a thorn right there flying around. If you don't. God said, I'm not going to drive them out for you. They are going to be a thorn in your side. We use that phrase now. Oh, I tell you, he's a thorn in my side. We use that phrase to this, came from the King James Bible. That God said, if you leave them there, it's going to, be, it's going to vex you. They're not going to be your friends. They're going to be your downfall. They're going to be your enemies. Because you left them there. So now look at Joshua 23. Joshua 23, he says it again. Joshua went in, and if you read the book of Joshua, you'll see that at one point, some of the inhabitants of Canaan figured out that Joshua was winning all the battles. They were winning all the wars, all the fights, and God was blessing Joshua, and they were clearing them all out. And some of these decided that they would not fight Joshua, but they would go to him as if they were impoverished people and beg Joshua to not kill them, to not, and Joshua allowed him, he actually made a covenant with them. And he said, you'll be hewers of wood, you'll be carriers of water, but I'll let you live. And right then and there, Joshua broke God's commandment. Because they were Canaanites, they were Hivites, they were Perizzites, they were Amorites, whatever it was. They were that, and God said, get rid of them. And Joshua refused at that point. So he allowed them in. So verse 13 of Joshua 23, God said, Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. But they shall be snares and traps unto you. And scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. Two things in this verse point you to Calvary. What did they do to Jesus before, uh, before he marched up to Calvary? What did they do to him? They scourged him. He was taking the stripes that we desert, and all of this relates to sin. Why do we get stripes? You get stripes by the law. The law said if you break certain, certain of the laws, can't remember which one it was, but if you break certain of the laws, you get 40 stripes. You get 40 lashes. Brother Reg Kelly made a point, very interesting point I never thought of, but he said that nation of Israel did not have a prison. 
They did not have a penitentiary system in the land of Israel. Punishment was either given out right then, or if you had a right to appeal, you could appeal, but then punishment was given, and it was never lock them up and hope that we can rehabilitate them. It was harsh, and it was cruel, and it was either, if, if, it, was, if it involved theft of some kind, maybe you had to pay them back double, or maybe you were to receive lashes, or maybe you were to have your life taken away right then and there. But there was no jails. There was no prison system. There was no reform system in the law. It was, it was done immediately. And that always has the effect of making sure that most people don't break the law. Because it was done right in front of everybody. And you have to ask yourself, you know, it, should it be that way in America? I don't know. I don't have the answer to it. I'm not a politician. But you have to ask yourself, is the prison system in this country working really well? No, it's not. I think we've gotten too soft. But anyway, but God said, know for a certainty that the Lord your God, notice what he said, the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. God stopped right there. And he said, I'm not going to do it anymore. And there's a reason why he left. God is the one now who's going to take credit for this. But there's a reason why he did it. Um, was that a ball game Friday night? And uh, boy, them Catholic boys beat up on Hillsboro bad. It was a whooping. But there was a man that walked in front of me. Had a Vietnam cap on, guys. And I stood up and I reached over and I, I said, Sir, I just want to tell you thank you for serving your country. You know what he said? It was an honor for me to serve my country. I like that. I like to say, I've never, I have never, when these guys wear a hat, I've never heard them say, don't thank me. I hated what I did. He's proud of it. These guys are proud of serving their country. They fought. They know how to fight. I don't care how old they get. If they're wearing a military cap, don't pick a fight with them. They may not be able to throw a punch very well. They still know how to shoot. Amen. They know how to pull a trigger. Don't pick a fight with them. Uh, and I have a point in all the Turn to Judges 2. There's a point in all this. We don't like wars. But war has a place in shaping and molding a society of people. It has a place. It has a place in shaping and molding young men. Young men. I don't know who came up with the snowflake title, maybe Clint Eastwood or whoever, but it fits. We have a nation of sissified snowflake boys in this country who feel like everybody owes them. They had a, on Life PD the other night, they were called to a house, 28-year-old man living in mama's house in his bedroom, and he got inflamed at her because she went in his room, violated his civil rights, and went in his room and found the methamphetamine that he had sitting out on the computer desk with his porn running. And he was on government, he was on the government handout program because he was disabled. So he was sitting, taking in, I don't know how much money a month, living in mama's house, doing drugs, sitting around looking at porn all day long. And mama said, I want him out. They arrested him because they went in his room and found a lot of drugs. I mean, a lot of drugs in his room. And he is complaining. He is mouthing off and calling his mother every name in the book. Okay? Something went wrong in that boy's life. And he's not learned how to stand up for himself and do for himself and fight for himself and take care of himself. He's not learned that. We have a lot of young people in this in this 
In this country, we have a lot of young men that I'm afraid if we were invaded, they would not fight for their country. And I think some enemies know that. We've, we've lost something. That generation, that World War II generation, those guys are almost gone. Korean War guys, then it's going to be the Vietnam guys. And, I mean, we still got some Gulf guys around, but I'm just saying to you that for the most part, because our land has lived in peace, we do not know how to fight battles. And so we are raising a generation of young men who do not, who do not treasure our Constitution. They do not treasure the things that they have inherited. They're not special to them because they feel like they have a right to it. But freedom's never free. It always costs the blood of those who will stand and defend it. And we forgot that. How many of you agree with that so far? Okay. It's in your Bible. And this lesson, God had to teach me. Because I was not one to stand up for much of anything except for my own arrogance. And I begged God for years to take things out of my life and He wasn't doing it. So after trying this and trying that and reading this book and listening to this motivational speech or whatever God showed me about thorns and God showed me about having an enemy that will buffet you um, there are some people who will fight at the drop of a hat always wanting to fight all you gotta do is say the wrong word to them or look at them wrong way or whatever and they'll fight but to the rest of us, we're not normally fighters until we get good and mad. You make somebody mad enough, they're going to turn loose on you. Okay? And um, that's what it's like when God leaves you a messenger of Satan to buffet you. Okay, I love the bell. It's there for a reason, right? Let me read this verse and we'll pick up on this next Sunday. An angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you go out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. You shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And uh, where's the rest of it? Verse, look at uh, Judges chapter 3. Man, I don't have time to get into this, but go, go back up to verse 21 of Judges chapter 2. He said, I will also not, will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore, the Lord left those nations. The Lord did that. Your Bible's right. You asked God to take the thorns away, and God said no. You, you asked God to take your enemies away, to keep them from buffeting you. You ask God to take sins out of your life, and God said no. Why did he say no? To teach a young man how to fight. To teach a man or a woman how to fight. God wants soldiers. God wants battle-hardened people 
because he's coming back in Revelation 19 with an army clothed in white, 10,000 of his... I think a thing just hit me on the head. Maybe it's just me thinking that. But anyway, God wants soldiers, God's building an army, and God needs to teach every one of you how to stand up and fight your own battle. Okay? Uh, study Judges chapter 3, because he said it verbatim there. Because there's a generation here, after Joshua is dead, the younger generation, well that was daddy's war. Now I've inherited the land, and I get it for free. And God said, no, I left those enemies there, so that that generation knows how to fight too. Father, teach us, teach our hands to war. Teach our fingers, Lord, to know how to fight. To know how to grip a sword. To know how to hold a shield. To know, God, how to build faith in our lives. To know how to take a stand. know how to, to drive out devils. To know how to go to battle, not only for ourselves, but for our families. And our churches. And our brothers and sisters. And our, our country. God, teach us how to fight. The enemies are never going away. Teach us how to fight. Bless your word. Thank, thank you, dear God, for giving us a sword and a shield. Bless your people this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.